capacitor simulation example. The purpose of this video is to answer the question, what are we missing by not accounting for the fringing fields when we analyze capacitors or resistors or anything else? So the first thing we'll do here is compare the analytical versus numerical solutions. And then I'll talk a little bit just to answer the curiosity of how does the numerical analysis actually work? Comparison of analytical and numerical solutions. Let's start with the analytical solution for a parallel plate capacitor. So I'm showing a parallel plate capacitor over to the left and the top plate is carrying a charge of plus Q, the bottom plate is carrying a charge of minus Q. Between the plates is a dielectric medium with permittivity epsilon. The plates are separated by a distance D. And here, I guess we're just assuming these are square plates of surface area S. And in prior videos, we derived the capacitance of this structure, and we're showing that over on the right. So this is the derivation for capacitance that does not account at all for fringing fields. It assumes the electric field is perfectly constant and uniform between the plates, and no fringing fields or really nothing exists outside of the plates. Just out of curiosity, to, to address this curiosity, there do actually exist equations that modify this, that attempt to account for the fringing fields. These particular equations that I'm showing here are called Kirchhoff's approximation. And even these depend on that separation D being very small. So I'm showing two different forms of it, one for a circular plate parallel capacitor and another for a square plate. And what we can see the C term in here is the original derivation of capacitance that did not account for fringing. And so we can calculate a revised capacitance by adding on this extra term that is accounting for the fringing fields. And we'll do the calculations with those two just to see the difference. So for this example, we're going to let the plates be one meter by one meter and separated by one meter of air. A typical capacitor would have a much, much smaller separation with a surface area around one meter. That is reasonable, but the separation might be more like one micron. So already this is a little bit unreasonable for a capacitor and we're doing this to exaggerate the effect of the fringing fields. But the capacitance, the analytical equation that would ignore fringing fields, we get about 8.9 picofarads for that structure. If we use the Kirchhoff's approximation, we get almost 20 picofarads. Well, how would we account for the fringing fields in, uh, not exact, that's not the right word, but in a much more rigorous way. Well, what about a numerical solution? And in fact, that's what we'll talk about here. Jumping to the conclusion, applying this numerical method that we'll talk more about, we get 24 picofarads. So Kirchhoff's approximation came pretty close to that, even though the separation is relatively large. But the big thing is the numerical solution is predicting a higher capacitance than really either of the analytical equations above. And that's because there's still energy outside of the plates that is, it's, it's there, it contributes to capacitance, and if we ignore it, we will underestimate the capacitance. So the numerical model would start by defining three arrays in memory. The first array represents all of the space around and in the capacitor. And each point in this array, I'm assigning the relative permittivity. So this example, we just have air between the plates. So this array is filled with all ones. The next two arrays are defining the top and the bottom conductor. Those arrays are filled with all zeros, but we're placing ones where the metals go. And what you can see, we have metals. And if you were to look at this from the top, you would see that this is actually filling out a square. Uh, really hard to visualize a 3D array. And then the bottom conductor, similar thing, just below the center point. So with these three arrays, the numerical simulation understands everything about the capacitor, the size of the plates, the separation between them, the dielectric constant in the capacitor and even outside the capacitor. 
Skipping over the numerics, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, but we solve the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation. So we know all of the inputs, this we know everything about the capacitor, and we can solve that to calculate the electric potential. Well, the electric potential that the analytical solution is giving us really would look like this, where it varies linearly from the top plate to the bottom plate, and it does not exist, we're not even accounting for it outside of the capacitor. If we calculate this electric potential numerically, well, what we could see is we actually do have an electric potential outside the plates. It's rather not uniform on the, on the inside, and we'll see that a little bit more obviously through the electric field when we visualize that. But I also want to mention something. When we're looking at the electric potential, it's easy to make a mistake and look and, oh, we, we have something interesting going on here or something interesting going on here. And it's not quite correct to think of the electric potential as something. The, the something that we want to think about is the electric field. The electric potential, the change in the electric potential is the electric field. And so we don't look at the electric field and think there must be something crazy going on here because we actually have to take the gradient of this and that's the electric field. The electric field's the actual thing. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at the, 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 the electric potential. Given the electric potential, we'll calculate the gradient of that, put in the negative sign, and we'll have the electric field intensity. So for the analytical solution, again, it's a uniform amplitude, and it's all in the same direction pointing from the top to the bottom plate. Well, it's much more interesting for the numerical solution. And here we can actually see much more clearly that this is not a uniform amplitude electric field. And even more, even before we get to outside the plates, the fields are already starting to fringe and to bend. But certainly there's pretty intense fields outside and we get the fringing fields on the outside. And all of the field out here is also storing energy that our analytical solution would completely ignore. So there's more than just ignoring the fringing fields going on here. There's non-uniform fields between the plates that our analytical solution would miss. Well, after we have the electric field intensity, we simply multiply by the permittivity to get the electric flux density. And once we have those two fields, we essentially know everything about the problem and we can go on to calculate the capacitance. So this is done in two steps. The total energy stored is really the volume integral of one half of D dot E. We know D, we know E, we can calculate the dot product at every point in our grid, our arrays, and add them all up to get total energy stored. If we have that, then the capacitance, which is really defined as the charge on the plates divided by the applied voltage. But if we remember from previous lectures, the charge on the plates is related to total energy stored divided by the, the applied voltage. But there's this mystery two here. And that's really because there's two plates carrying the charge Q. So we have twice as much as we think we would. Anyway, we bring this applied voltage down to the denominator and we have the applied voltage squared. So two times stored energy divided by applied voltage squared would give us the capacitance. So if we do that, the numerical answer gives us 24.1 picofarads. And remember that original analytical uh, equation gave us 8.9 picofarads. But the Kirchhoff's approximation gave us something more like 20 picofarads. So it was actually a much better analytical equation to use. But in either case, the numerical simulation is counting for non-uniform fields, fringing fields, just takes into account a lot more of the physics. Using this model, we can study the effect of certain things. What about the separation between the plates? So the picture we're looking at on the left is the electric flux density for the capacitor that we've been looking at as an air core. Um, the plate dimension is one by one meter. The separation is one meter. So it looks like a cube. Then I have the separation between the plates. And if I look at the error between the analytical and numerical solution, the error 
goes way down. And looking at the electric flux density, it's a little bit apparent why. Notice as we close the separation, a greater proportion of the energy from the field is between the plates. And it's possibly even looking a little bit more uniform between the plates. So the field is a bit more consistent with the physics that we assumed when we were taking the analytical solution. And in fact, as that gap goes narrower and narrower and narrower, we would see the rigorous simulation match almost exactly the analytical equation. What about the effect of a dielectric fill? So here we're not changing the dimensions, but we're adding a dielectric constant. So on the left, we have a dielectric constant of one between the plates, and on the right, a dielectric constant of 12. Well, our error again went way down, really for the same reasons. It's making the field between the plates have a much more uniform electric field, and a greater proportion of the energy does reside between the plates and not outside. So it again is more consistent with the physics that our analytical solution was assuming. So now imagine you have small separation and a high dielectric constant, and we can see that that analytical equation we have would give us a very good answer. The reason we're not getting great answers here is because I've made a very extreme capacitor that has a huge separation and is not even realistic for a capacitor actually. So how does the numerical analysis work? I don't think I'm gonna be able to give you enough information to implement this on your own. I have other resources if you're interested, but I can give you a taste of what's happening numerically. The first thing is we need to make our functions discrete. So I'm plotting here an electric potential. That's a smooth, continuous sort of analytical thing. That has an infinite amount of information in it, and we can't store an infinite amount of information on a computer. So what do we do? Well, the solution method I use called the finite difference method I make space discrete. So I will have an array, and this array has 16 by 16 numbers in it, and that would represent my electric potential over whatever area of space this is. So each one of these cells in here has a width of delta x and a height of delta y. And so I call these the grid resolution parameters. But now the electric potential stored in an array that if I plotted, I would see a picture of that. We just have to remember it is actually discrete and the real thing would be nice and smooth and continuous on the left. Once our functions are discrete, that lets us approximate the derivatives in whatever equation we have to solve with finite differences because we have to take derivatives from the discrete data. Well, we want to solve Laplace's equation. So I'll extend or expand Laplace's equation into Cartesian coordinates. And this first term, we're going to have a second order partial derivative of the electric potential with respect to X, the second one with respect to Y, and the third one with respect to Z. So this is an analytical derivative, but we've just made our electric potential discrete. So how do we estimate a second order derivative in the x direction? Well, that's this term over on the left. And there's a whole story about where this comes from. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to get into that. But what you'll see is three adjacent values from the grid. And we divide that, we do some math with that. We, we take one and subtract two of another and add another and then divide by the grid spacing delta x squared. We'll do another thing for our y derivative and then a third one for the z derivative. And where this comes from is, is a longer story. I teach that in my computational methods class, not worth going into here. But what we can see here is we have a discrete equation that's containing terms from the arrays and we've replaced our analytical derivatives with these finite differences. Well, then what we'll do is we'll multiply all of that out and we collect the common terms on the electric potentials. And this is the form that we need when we wanna write it in the form of a matrix. So if we have an array, the last array we showed was like 16 by 16 points, and I should have figured out what 16 by 16 squared is. Let's just say it's 200 points total in that array. We would have to write that equation 
at each point in the array. So we would come away with that equation written 200 different times. So what do we do with large sets of equations? We get a matrix equation. And our matrix equation can be written this way, L times V equals zero. In this case, V is a column vector storing all of the electric potentials throughout our grid. So if we're going with this array of 16 by 16, which we said is 200 total points, well, we would have 200 numbers in this column vector, although we haven't found them yet. So these are going to be 200 unknown numbers. And I have it written here for a full three-dimensional array. So if we had 16 by 16 by 16 points, I don't have a calculator on me. Let's say that's 1,000 points. We would have 1,000 numbers in this column vector. So this zero is a column vector of all zeros because you remember that discrete equation we had always had zero on the right-hand side. And L is a big square matrix where all of the coefficients go into. And it's essentially enforcing Laplace's equation on V. This is the matrix form of Laplace's equation. And if we're interested in what this matrix looks like, I've plotted over on the right. This is called a diagonal matrix. That's because the orange area is all zeros. We only have numbers going down certain diagonals and there's lots of specialized algorithms and it's a huge field of study in linear algebra to deal with these sparse matrices. Okay, well, V is unknown. We have numbers put in L. We have numbers in the zeros, it's all zeros. How do we solve for the electric potential? Well, we would divide or pre-divide both sides by the inverse of L. And so when we do that, we bring the L over the other side, we have L inverse times zero. Well, that just still gives us a zero column vector. So it's saying the electric potential is zero everywhere. That doesn't make any sense because we know that's not true. Well, we have not told this problem yet what voltages we're holding the plates to. So we, we haven't communicated the applied voltage. And so the numerics here just doesn't know what to do and it just gives all zeros for the electric potential. So we have to give this what the applied voltage is. And when we do that, the zero over here will no longer be zero. So the way we modify our matrix equation is this way. So we have this big square matrix L, we have our column vector V, and then we have our column vector of all zeros. So every row in this matrix somehow corresponds to a point over in our array. Well, most of those points don't have metals in them, so we don't do anything. But every once in a while, we'll come across a point where there's a metal. And what we'll do is zero out that entire row. We'll place a one in the diagonal position. And then over on the right here, we enter the voltage that this particular piece of metal has, what has been applied to that little piece of metal. And so we do this for all of the pieces of metal on the top plate and the bottom plate. And so we end up modeling, you know, or changing, modifying 100 rows or so in this matrix equation. But now this column vector over on the right is no longer zeros, and we'll call that B. And our matrix L has actually been modified, so it's a slightly different L than it was before. Now it's solvable. We can do a backward division, and there's lots of algorithms out there for doing that. We can do it by like a direct LU decomposition, iteration, many other things. But we can calculate the electric potential, and if we plot it, now we can see a much more rigorous electric potential around those plates. Well, after that, we'll take the negative gradient of the electric potential, we'll calculate the electric field intensity. Using the constitutive relation, we calculate the electric flux density, and this can look different if there's a dielectric medium here. Notice this approach, we could even have a non-uniform permittivity here and do other crazy things. We could have permittivity on the outside and this model would still work and be able to calculate the capacitance. Well, from there, uh, I don't do this in two steps where I calculate total stored energy, then plug that into the equation for capacitance. I do this all at once. And that final equation just looks like this when all is said and done. Notice the applied voltage isn't there. That's because in my simulations, I always apply one volt. So I don't even have to divide by the, the 
apply voltage squared. If I decided to apply two volts, there's no reason to do that, but I would actually need to compensate for that here. That looks like something crazy, super difficult to do. Well, here's the line of code in MATLAB. So this D transpose E is actually performing the dot product and summing all of the values on the grid. So it's actually a discrete numerical integration. And then we have our epsilon naught, that's the free space permittivity. And our DV differential is actually DX times DY times DZ. And these are the dimensions of the cell on our grid.